This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. Mark Feldman joined the US Army on January the 6th, 1981. He graduated in April 1981 and was selected for instructor tank commander and trained the next cycle of recruits until August 1981. He was then posted to West Germany in September and was assigned to the 1st 37th Armour of the 1st Armoured Division out of Katabak. When he arrived they were just changing from the M60A2 to the M60A3 and Mark was made a gunner on C22 he was also picked to serve with the 1st 304th Bundeswehr Panzer Unit in Leopard 1A4s and described some fascinating details of the differences between the Bundeswehr and the US Army. In 1982, his friend Dean McCoy was killed in a military accident and Mark experienced PTSD for the last 30 years as a result. We dedicate this episode to the memory of Sammy Dean McCoy who died on March the 18th, 1982, aged 21. Please welcome Mark Feldman to our Cold War conversation. Uh, My motivation for joining the Army. (laughs) Well, when I was 15, my mother threatened to send me to military school. So that's planted the seed to (laughs) show her something. (laughs) Why did she threaten to send you to military school? (laughs) You know, you're a 15 year old, you're acting like a little jerk. So, yeah, she just said it in an angry moment. And that seed was planted. Then, when I turned uh, 18, I went to the recruiter. I was still in high school, but, uh, you know, find out what I needed to do and everything. So, when, when you saw the recruiter, was that at the point you sort of chose what you wanted to do in the army, or did you not really have a clue at that point? Uh, when I saw the movie The Battle of the Bulge, they had all the tanks in it and that. So that was kind of how I got to be interested in being a, a tanker. <laughs> so Robert Shaw was your inspiration. Is that what you'd say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> Even though they had all the wrong tanks in that film. <laughs> you know, what was was amazing. All those tanks were our target tanks <laughs> that we shot at. <laughs> Yeah, and even though it's supposed to be in the Ardennes, uh, I think they filmed it somewhere in Spain, so it looked like desert they were in. (laughs) It's the first time I've heard the Battle of the Bulge being somebody's uh, inspiration for for joining the army, but that's a great answer. What were your first impressions of West Germany? It was was a very... uh, I was amazed the bus fit through half the towns that we had to go through. I mean... Because, you know, they put us on this big bus and they're driving us all over to the different uh, concerns that they're dropping guys off at. And, yeah, I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> what difference did you notice there versus being in the, in the U.S.? What, what were the, the things you found sort of difficult to get used to, apart from the tunnels? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the people, are, people actually treated us very good there. They were very nice to us all the time. You know, even though we were all this bunch of eighteen-year-olds, <laughs> and and you know that the, the, it's a different environment. The second you're out of a city, you're in the country right away. It's not like even in the U.S. You know, cities are sprawled for twenty, thirty miles. You don't see anything but you know buildings. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people I speak to say West Germany was one of the best postings they ever they ever had. We were all, we were always busy. It was always uh, you know we were on a war footing all the time. So. <laughs> So where where did you get posted to? What was your location? Well, I was sent to 1st Armored Division, the 1st or 37th in Kauterbach, which is just outside of Ansbach. It was a little one battalion post, which was unusual. And uh, it was a very, very nice post. We were in an old uh, Luftwaffe Air Force Base. <laughs> Across the street was the helicopter brigade. That was the, air, that was the old Luftwaffe airfield, and we were in the other side of the street. I understand that they they had been on the M sixty A two, is that correct? Right. When I got there, they they were still going through the transition. I got there about a week before they got back from Grafenvir, 
where they had traded in their A2s for the A3s. What was the difference between the A2 and and the A3? Uh, the A, A2 was a totally different kind of vehicle. Uh, they had the gun missile system, the 152 millimeter uh, Shillelagh missile with the 152 millimeter heat round. Uh, everybody had their own hatch in an A2. The gunner had a hatch, the you know, loader had a hatch. Uh, it was like night and day, but it just never worked out. <laughs> yeah, it was an unusual uh, tank having that combined system because I think the Soviets had something similar, but still with a sort of main battle tank gun, whereas you had a very short muzzle. Yeah, I, I don't think the Soviets ever designed it for like, the, you know, the Shalali missile was like a like like a tow missile, basically, but you kept the reticle on the target and it would just go wherever the reticle was pointing. Somebody's bright idea that didn't come off. Hey, you know, it sounded good in practice, but it really didn't work out in, in reality. <laughs> I've invited a couple of guys that were there when I was coming in. They were the A2 tankers to your site, so maybe you could ask them. I was surprised there was only four A2 battalions in the whole U.S. Army. <laughs> so it wasn't a, wide, it wasn't a widespread uh, produced tank. No, I've seen some photos of them. They look like uh, stunted M60A1s. How close are you to the inner German border where you're stationed? We were one of the closest battalions, except for the cavalry. The cavalry is right almost on the border. We were the next closest to the the Hof Gap border. Okay, so you're down near uh, Czechoslovakia, down that way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right, we're Czechoslovakia, Jut- juts in the West Germany. Yep, that's where we're at. You're dropped off at Katerbach, and how do you get assigned to a crew? Well, once well, once you enter the company, the they were parcel off who's going where and what. Uh, most, I think there were about four of us entering the company when they were in transition, and we all were assigned to second platoon mostly, so... They, they, you know, guys that were, they always know guys that are leaving. So they produce the guys that are there. You know, I, I actually know the guy that I replaced. His name was, uh, Dale Cronister. So I, uh, <laughs> I always joke to him. Yeah. I had to come to, so you could go home. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, the crew that you end up with, they've been working to weather together for some time, I guess. I mean, how, how do you sort of fit in there? Well, in reality, there really are very few full crews on any main battle tanks. We're usually just maybe three guys if you're lucky. Sometimes there's only two. But, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's not like you think it is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, right away, I was I was only an E2 when I got there, but they put me in the gunner seat right away because I had the tank commander experience from Fort Knox. So. They thought you were an expert, huh? Well, they, they kind of knew I, I knew a lot more than they did. <laughs> what sort of uh, aiming system did the uh, did the tank have at that point? Well, the tanks at Fort Knox, uh, unusually, they didn't have uh, the thermal sights. Only one of them had the thermal sight at, equipped because they were so short of thermal sights, they all went to Germany. So I had never seen a thermal sight until I got there. I had had the passive sight which was, you know, a piece of crap. But the thermal site is the main site that sets the A3 apart from anything else. Did it have gun stabilization as well? So could you fire on the move? No, it, it had sta- the only tank that did not have stabilization was the blade tank. And it was because the headlights are elevated on the blade tank. So if you had stabilization, this gun tube would smash into the headlight brackets. So <laughs> for that reason, it didn't have yeah. And we'll come on to the uh, the blade tank in a moment. So, speaking to other tankers, you're you're having regular firing exercises. How, how well did you rate Mark against the uh, the rest of them? Yeah, I did. I, my first uh, time at Gunnery, we obviously we uh, passed. We were satisfactory, but uh, it it really is a crew. It's just not the gunner. So everybody has to gel together and work together. There are a lot of poor tank commanders that like to, what we say is they like to play up the override too much. You know, the fire command is the way it is. When I say identified as a gunner, that tells the tank commander, let go of the override. I see what you want me to shoot at. Because as long as he's got the override, I, I have no control where I'm going. Did they 
talk to you about the threat you're facing there and your life expectation should the Soviets come over the border? They never went into how long we would survive, but you know, it, it doesn't take long for you to figure out. It's it's the odds weren't good for us. And we all had this in our back of our heads. We had to get seven of them before they got us. So I'll tell you, we were all geared up for firing around every four to five seconds and getting a first round hit every four to five seconds. So, you know, you can imagine a Soviet company coming out of the woods and within a minute they would all be dead. And you and you were confident in your abilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. E- even a poor gunner could really hit good with an A three. As long as everybody knew their job and knew what they were doing, yeah, it was it was a pretty good tank. If you got called out, did you know where you were going to be positioned? You you had pre positioned locations. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, we always had this saying: when we went on alert one, about once a month, which is alert is you know they knock on your door at three o'clock in the morning. It's an alert. We have to get out going. And you have about an hour and a half to get everything onto the tank and out the back gate. So, you know, most of the time we would just line up at the gate and then the alert would be called off. But other times you'd go out and we'd go to the right, which would be go to the local training area and mess around there for a day or two. We always said, if we go to the left, we're in trouble. And then the one day we went to the left. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the day we moved up to our battle positions at around half. <laughs> Do you know whether it's for real or not for real? Well, we knew it wasn't for real because they didn't issue us machine gun ammunition. We always had the full main gun ammunition loaded on the tank all the time. But in, everybody said, well, if we don't get any machine gun ammunition, we know it's, it's, not, it's not happening. <laughs> and, and your position around Hoff, were they... Were they already dug out as hull-down positions or, or not? No. The Germans had this thing about they didn't want us having any fixed positions in West Germany. They didn't want Germany to turn into a Korea, I guess. So there was no – we were just always in the woods. We, uh, we had, uh, you know, the Forstmeister, he took care of the woods, and there we had pretty good lanes of where we could move a tank through those trees and stuff. So, yeah, we were just always in the woods. That's all we were. <laughs> I, I hear stories from other tankers that as soon as you're stationary, uh, German kids would turn up out of nowhere. Is that what you found? <laughs> yeah, the guy with the car would pull up with the bread in the trunk, try to sell us stuff to eat. And <laughs> they always knew. So were there people that sort of followed you around just trying to sell you stuff? There's always people trying to make a buck off us. It was fine. You know, because we never, we never had marks on us, so they're getting – and back then the mark was uh, – 2.5 marks to the dollar so you know they're they're they're, they're, they're getting a better rate selling it to us <laughs> i understand that you uh had a couple of weeks with the bundeswehr can you uh take me through that yeah and i had been there there about six months and it was a january i guess i got there in september and uh they had this who wants to go with the Ger- work with the Germans at Grafenwehr for two weeks? And yeah, I was lucky enough I got picked. You know, I said, yeah, I'll go. And I got picked to do it. And it, it was, they came, picked us up at the barracks, and they drove us there in their Jeeps. And uh, it was a pretty exciting experience, I have to say. They were, they were a unique army. <laughs> what, what differences did you see? Oh, well, first off, what's right when I got there? They were refueling the tanks. Now, in our army, the U.S. Army, when we refuel tanks, we have this big fuel gore. It's a, uh, it's a big off-road vehicle, but it's, you know, it's like a mobile gas station. You've, you hand you the pump, you put it in the thing, and you push the button, and, uh, you know, 30, uh, 10 minutes later, 150 gallons are in our tank, and he's gone to the next tank. The Germans, this truck pulls up with five-gallon tanks, and they're taking five-gallon tanks off the back of the truck and f- refueling the tank with them. I'm like, God, it's going to take you guys forever. It takes the whole crew to refuel the tank, where one guy could refuel our tank. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, th- they have to offload the 35-gallon cans for that tank to get refueled. <laughs> so so that was like, well, okay, that's not... <laughs> you think you're going to do this in wartime? I don't think so. <laughs> How different was the leopard to the uh, m60 a3 the, the the germans you know were a3 we were sit in the woods snipe pull back you fire two three rounds pull back go in another position come back out snipe 
three, four rounds back again. The Leopard Davis would like charge it. You know, their their whole training was charge across the field and shoot, shoot, shoot. <laughs> so, so their training was offensive rather than <laughs> defensive. Pretty, pretty, pretty much, yeah. They were, <laughs> and the Leopard was, you know. It was a very fast and stable platform. I mean, it was a smooth ride, but it was crowded in that tank. Maybe A3 had a lot more elbow room than you had in a Leopard. Was it the same number of crew? Yeah. It was, you know, most main battle tanks are four, four crewmen. I never understood the whole auto, auto loader thing because you're losing a guy. You know, every time something breaks, you need, the, you need a guy to start helping you fix the stuff, which the Germans weren't big on fixing stuff, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Yeah, I've got an interview coming up with a T-72 tank commander who's served in the East German Army, and uh, autoloader will definitely come up because they only had a crew of three in, right. in there. But um, I, I hear it was uh, pretty easy to fix stuff on, on one of those because they were pretty basic tanks. But anyway, I'll, say, I'll save that for the uh, episode. Um, did you have a go at driving a, a Leopard? No, the Germans wouldn't let me drive. Oh, that's a shame. Had your rep- reputation preceded you or something? No, it was just something about the because they, they they had rearview mirrors on the Leopard and everything. I never seen the tank with rearview mirrors anyway. <laughs> Maybe they were worried about their insurance. It was, there was something about that. Yeah, they wouldn't let us. Uh, anything else we could do, but we couldn't drive their vehicles. So. Uh, did you have a chance to fire the the main gun? Oh yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Oh yeah, they they put us in the tank and uh, we got to sit in the. I got to do the gunner seat and I got the load too. So that was uh, that was interesting. You know, in the leopard, the the shell comes out and they have a basket to catch it. Where in the A three, you know, the shell comes out, it's going to wang around the turret floor. You stop it down with your foot and you throw the next shell in real quick. <laughs> what was the aiming system like? How did that compare to what you're used to? Uh, it was the old coincidental sight, you know, you press the foot pedal and when the sight, when the target becomes clear, that's when you're on target. And did it have any night vision or anything like that? It had like a, they, they mounted a night, uh, this is another thing I didn't understand because it's mounted on the outside of the tank, a night vision camera, which was better than the passive sight, but nowhere as good as the uh, thermal sight. And I was like, how long do you think that's going to last in wartime mounted outside? It's going to, first artillery barrage is going to tear that off. So, I mean, you're, you're with them for two weeks. What, what are their rations like? I'm going to tell you, I have graphing is where we go to for gunnery. You know, it's the basics when we go there. These guys are sitting with cloth on the table and they have mess attendants serving you. But I was in the NCO's uh, mess hall. So, I, uh, but yeah, I'm like, uh, we never see this even back in garrison do they have this kind of stuff, <laughs> eating off of China plates and stuff. I, I felt bad for the Germans that had to come with us when we went to Graf because uh, they weren't going to get that kind of treatment. <laughs> yeah, they must have thought, oh, the Americans, we're going to have the uh, first class service here. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 no. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, were there any, any other memorable events uh with you with, with the germans well i'll tell you the you know the one thing that never stuck with me was uh they have like the room at the gunnery ranges where we have like uh briefings and stuff and and i go in there and these guys are belting the ammunition themselves by hand and now, you know, like with the crank and they're putting the bullets in the line and cranking. I go, oh my God, what? <laughs> we, we just open up the box, pull out 250 rounds and it's all ready to go. You guys are loading, belting all your ammo by hand. What is that? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like because you pointed it out, you know, both with the refueling and with the ammo belts that they were a bit behind the times with those. But certainly as far as service in the mess hall, they were way ahead of you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. in comfort, they were way ahead. But I think it was just because it was a conscript army and it was busy work to keep them busy. That's what I think what they were mostly doing. Yeah, yeah. I slept with the uh, enlisted men and the NCO slept in another part. But, uh, you know, they, they were all had their little pocket calendars with how many days i have left in the army thing and stuff like that <laughs> so you were in with these conscript guys yeah 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 most every all the enlisted men are conscripts in the german army 
Did you find their attitude different because they weren't professional army? They were professional, but, you know, we were all volunteers, which you never failed to remind us at Fort Knox, by the way. You know, we didn't ask you to come here. You wanted to be here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a different mindset. It's a different attitude, you know. Did you have any contact with the Brits when you were there? No, the British were too far up north right, for us. Yeah, to, that's what I thought. Yeah. What about the French? Uh, the French, uh, a little bit when we had to go to Wild Flicken one time for winter gunnery. And uh, they they left the barracks in a in a state for us to take care of. Yes, <laughs> let's let's just say you'd never see a U.S. unit leave a barracks like that. Did you see any of the uh, Soviet military liaison mission vehicles at all while you were there? Once in a while, you might catch as long as he doesn't stop on the highway. We have to leave him alone. But if we catch him stopped on the highway, then you can block him in and wait for the military police to show up. But yeah, you see the license plates, but you just leave him alone otherwise. But I will say when I was at Grafenberg, the one thing, the Germans, they had like this firepower demonstration. I guess it was, you know, like the chancellor was there and everything. They, they, the guys took, the NCOs took us there for this. It was nothing I've ever seen. You know, the German tanks are all going across the field, firing at range, targets down range. They got the Gephards uh, taking branches off the fir trees to show how their firepower is. Then all of a sudden they have like f one hundred four screaming in overhead, uh, unleashing a rocket barrage on this tree line. It was, you know, it was like a demonstration of German firepower, at, and it was pretty impressive, I have to say. You know, and then they had the A-10 fly over, and it was like, burp, burp. <laughs> it wasn't as impressive as the F-104s. <laughs> yeah, but probably more effective on the ground, on a, on a target, but <laughs> anyway. Yeah, but more effective at killing, yeah, more effective at killing tanks, but not scaring the crap out of you, know. <laughs> wow, that must have been a hell of a, hell of a sight, that. That that one was a it's 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 stuck with me even to this day. Yeah, so I was glad I got to see that too. That. Yeah. And what was the intention of you working with the Germans? What was the the benefit that you were supposed to be getting from that? We all have a partnership unit, and it was our partnership unit, so it was kind of like you know, give and take. You know, since then, like I said, they would come to Graf when we went there, and they would see what we were like. As I tell you, the, Ger the, Ger the Germans had no concept of what the thermal site was. They, they thought they were, I mean, I, tell you, I would get a little bit ahead, but uh, the one reforger I was on, I mean, we're sitting in the uh, trees and we're at night, and I could see the truck pull up. I could see these three trucks pull up on the Autobahn because I got the thermal site going. I see them all walking across the field. Then they have like some little group meeting in the middle of the field. <laughs> You know, they, they didn't know we're watching them the whole time. I go, what do you think you're pulling? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, then we, 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 we unload on them then with the with the fake rounds and everything. So they their little laser beepers go off and stuff. <laughs> I'm surprised that they didn't have a, a decent sight on. The, was this Leopard 2 you were on or Leopard 1? A, le, a, a Leopard 1A4. So it was like the last, almost the last version of the Leopard. No, the Leopard 2 probably has a thermal site because, you know, by then they know it. Well, the A3 was the first one to have. And then the A3 had a better thermal site than the M1 did, the original M1. It, it really was the game changer, though. You know, it, not, night meant nothing to us anymore. We, we could operate. Yeah. You, can, you can't hide a tank. <laughs> when you were in Germany, did they show you any Soviet vehicles to help with recognition or anything like that? Well, we had all passed recognition courses when we were in basic, but they had a demonstration platoon at Grafenbeer with Soviet vehicles. Yeah, right. And what what did they have there? T sixty two, T fifty fives, BMPs, BRDMs. You know, the, they didn't have a T seventy two. Yeah. So uh, probably stuff they'd got off the Israelis or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the, the the basic concept of fire of our firing order was you take out stuff of antennas first and then you take out anti-air vehicles second and then everything else is third as far as aiming at an enemy tank were there particular areas that you were told to go for or was it no, really just try and no. get it on the target and hope that you hit something that's yeah you just uh, <laughs> right so it's not like hollywood no it's you the same center mass and you you hope for a kill hit yeah after graph and fair um, what what's next for you? Well, then we usually go to Hohenfeldt, which is a nightmare and a half. And that's where we go do maneuver training at. Grafenbeer's for gunnery. Hohenfeldt is just to make us suffer for two, two to three weeks. 
I wonder whether it's a bit like Saltow, which the uh, the British used, where they just said it was mosquito infested and like a moonscape, really difficult to navigate your your way round. What what was uh, this place like, Hohenfels? Hohenfels was a piece of Germany that they walled off after World War II. There was little towns in there. They told us never to go in the buildings because you'll fall through the floors and it's all cow crap under floors. And <laughs> so never take a tank near the buildings. And it just seems like it was always raining and muddy every time we went to Hohenfels. <laughs> it was just miserable. You're always throwing tracks, and it's just a it's a it's a survival training basically. Did you do training for fighting in built up areas or anything like that? No, we would we would we we would avoid cities pretty much. Uh, we might go through a town a little bit, but no. But the end, yeah, the. The A3, the M60, it could elevate its gun to uh, shoot above the second story, where the Soviet tanks can't you know, elevate their guns that high. And, of course, with the cupola of 50 cal, you could shoot anything up five, six stories. Were you trained in escape and evasion if you were, if you were hit? <laughs> well, I was the gunner, and I wasn't going to make it out of the tank alive if we were hit. So, <laughs> but yeah, we we had we had escape and evasion courses, uh, just something to keep us busy. Yeah, and what was that like? What was an escape and evasion course like? It, it was more like a map course. You know, you, you had your map, and you'd be together as a crew, and you'd have to go from point to point. And uh, they'd have the helicopter boys up with their side looking radar, trying to spot us in the woods and stuff like that. Uh, they didn't go as far as the British with the fake interrogations and stuff like that, no? Uh, well, they always told us, you know, just don't lie in an interrogation because you might, by you lying, you might accidentally tell them something you don't need to know. <laughs> just try to keep as much as you can, but, you know, at the end, whatever they want to know, just tell them. Cause <laughs> we really don't know that much anyway, <laughs> so what can they get out of us? <laughs> yeah, I can tell you where the on-off switch is on the tank, but that that's... <laughs> That's the only military secret I can betray. Um, now, at some point, you're assigned to the blade tank. Now, what is a blade tank? The blade tank is a it has a five ton blade on the front of it. So we're the heaviest tank in the unit. We have our own special railway car when we rail load because you know we're we're heavier than the other tanks. So, and uh, we're basically there to as a mine clearer because they hadn't quite developed a roller yet that would work the mine rollers. Well, I was there when they were trying to do that and it just, they could never get the damn roller on, you know, we get one side on, we couldn't get the other side on. So it's worthless. So, and uh, so then we just use the blade tank to clear minefields, which that's basically what it was made for to clear minefields and to make berms and to fill in ditches. You know, So it's like a bulldozer tank. Yeah. It's 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 faster than the bulldozer, but yeah, but it can't articulate the blade. The blade is this up and down. That's it. We can't move it, you know, side to side to to contour with the hillside or something. So, does it have a a gun on it as well? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's it's a, it's a fully functional tank, except there's no stabilization on it. So when we go to gunnery, we shoot from the short halt. It means you you're supposed to stop the tank. I would always just tell the driver, just put it. Let's put it in neutral and let it coast. Don't stop it because it stops. Then we got to wait for it to level up, you know, because it'll shake back and forth for four or five seconds. And seconds count in gunnery, you know. Seconds, the time sticking. I'll say, I'll say this: gunnery was king. You had to learn if you couldn't pass gunnery, you, you were in big trouble. <laughs> so, if you didn't pass gunnery, were you assigned to the infantry or something like that, or, or what happened? <laughs> well, they, they would they they would switch gunners out of the seat if they were that bad. Yeah and put somebody else in and give them a shot at it, yeah. But we went to gunnery twice a year, so the first time was practice, and that's where they would try to iron out all the difficulties they had until we went for the qualification gunnery, which was later on. Do you want to talk about May 83 and the um, gunnery at Graf and the, the failure? Oh, oh, yeah, the 13th Armor. <laughs> yeah, they they came back from gunnery. We, we just heard this on the grapevine, you know, but they came back from gunnery, and they did miserably. And so they had to set up a new course, and they blamed it on the new, the new course. They just said it wasn't fair. It wasn't a yeah, first armored isn't going to have that. So all of a sudden we get tapped to go to gunnery early. Send the the thirty seventh armored always gets sent to do something crappy all the time, you know. <laughs> so it's, that's been our history from World War Two on. You know, if, if it's if it's a if it's a job that needs to be done but it's crappy, send us. We'll we'll do it. <laughs> 
So uh, we get sent there, and uh, uh, we we really dis, uh, embarrassed the thirteenth because, uh, like I said, a guy from B Comp uh, A Company was the top gunner for First Armored Division. I was the second top gunner for First Armored Division. We had all distinguished scores, so it it was nothing wrong with the course. There was something wrong with the thirteenth armor. Yeah. <laughs> so so obviously that CO was in trouble after that. So yeah. <laughs> To give you an idea, to give you an idea, see, we have uh, different targets, to, and the one was the threat platoon, which is three tanks pop up. Now, I killed the threat platoon in nine seconds, so that tells you how quickly a, a, a platoon of Soviet tanks could be uh, eviscerated. Yeah, you know, but, but before 30 seconds was up, a, a platoon of ours would wipe out a company of theirs. So, no, that's a really good indication. No, thanks, thanks for um, sharing that. Um, did your tank have a name? We were just Charlie Six Eight. That was it. You did, <laughs> or everybody just every, everybody just always called us the Blade Tank. Cause <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, yeah, because yeah. you're pretty unmistakable. We were we were the biggest boy in the, in the parking lot. <laughs> I bet one of the uh, the more popular uh, routines you had to do was like NBC. Oh yeah, we were we were heavily. Tra- I, I was surprised that the Gulf War that they were so concerned about chemical warfare because you know it's not it's nothing to be i'm concerned about but we were prepared as we could be for chemical warfare and and you know we trained all the time yeah so what was the 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 timings that you were expected to get geared up for uh chemical warfare yeah you had about a minute to get your mask on yeah and, and i always wore my nbc out suit because it was more comfortable than the uniform so i was always ahead of the game there yeah <laughs> And even inside the tank, you had to wear it. Yeah, we did. We didn't have the Germans. Now their tank was over. They're overpressured, so nothing can get in. Our tank wasn't. We, we had a little hose system we could hook up our gas mask to. It would blow warm or cold air on our faces. But the only time we used it, it put us all to sleep because we were so sweaty. We put the cold air on our face. All of a sudden, we all just fell asleep. <laughs> So what about if you're fording a river or something like that? We don't, we don't, for, we try not to ford. Yeah, it, it's the same thing. It's just a different turn. But yeah, we, we try not to ford rivers at all. You know, if it's a stream, yeah, if it's a river, no, we'll, we'll wait for the bridge to get set up. We're, we don't have that. Yeah, we, we had the sump pump system and, uh, you know, they had the, the blow up of seal for the turret, but nobody ever tried to put that to, to use. So when when you're on exercise, have you got any memorable stories? Yeah, we were on Car- uh, Reforger, Carbine Fortress, uh, in 1982. That was when the M1 was first introduced to Germany for uh, exercises, too. We were actually at Gunnery when the M1 came up to do a practice run because they were just integrating them into the, I think it was the 3rd Infantry back then. And so Carbine Fortress... Uh, the war starts at midnight, okay? So we, 1201, we're sent off on a special mission, the three blade tanks from the 37th. It's the only time we've ever been all put together as a unit, all three of us together. And we go to this hillside, and we have to knock down these trees and make a road because in the morning, the Luxembourg Infantry Brigade is going to cross the river, set up a perimeter, and then we're gonna, they're going to have a bridge built across that. And through this road we just made, the rest of the army is going to come charging down. And so, you know, we didn't sleep at all, and we're there at midnight starting to do this. They had MPs all along the way uh, guiding us where we had to go, and we get up to the where we're supposed to be, and we start knocking down trees of our blade tanks. And, uh, you know, the blade tank really was never designed for knocking down trees. So <laughs> eventually two trees got us. One got us and one got the other one. Uh, I think there was only uh, Alpha Companies probably was the only one still running by the end of it. Knocked our track off. It knocked our track off. It knocked the hydraulic system off while it was knocking the track off. <laughs> so we had to get the blade back up in the lock position before all the hydraulic fluid leaked out. Because then we, well, there was a system to do it manually, but you needed the track on to do it. So <laughs> we were in trouble. <laughs> How do you, I mean, I'm just trying to think how you clear trees because you're not going to, are you getting them up by the roots as well or? Yeah, we're just, we're just, we're just ramming them with the blade and it, they're not huge trees. They're, you know, smallish. Actually, the tree that took out our track was probably no bigger than your forearm, but it caught on the end connector and it wedged up against another end connector and the tank pushed the track off itself. 
And as it was pushing the track up, it nicked the hydraulic line and it burst the line. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god! Because <laughs> I'm watching the whole thing is like in slow motion. I go, oh yeah, that's not good. Because <laughs> we're off, we're off the we're off the tank. I got the axe chopping the, the stuff out of the way that were knocked down. It's only the drivers in the tank, and the tank commander is like he sees the same thing I saw, and so he tells him get the blade up quick before we ran out of hydraulic fluid. <laughs> And then we had to break the track. and But, you know, it was really spectacular because we did all that at 6 o'clock in the morning. It was all ready. And here comes the whole battalion screaming down the trail that we just made. And yeah, it, it, it was like a D-Day moment for us. You know, we at least accomplished the mission before we all <laughs> got in trouble. Did you have to do it in the dark then? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was all dark. Yeah, yeah. The engineers had got there. The engineers got there ahead of us and laid out where we were supposed to knock down stuff. But, yeah, it was just all lost. Yeah. So how are you being able to see? Were you just, you know. Uh, just your eyes become accustomed to the darkness. and Yeah, I really can't explain. But, yeah, but when when you're in the dark, and the, it wasn't, it was like a, like a full moon, I think. Because we had a lot of ambient light. Usually, yeah, when you're in the forest in Germany, I mean, I was in one spot when I dropped my helmet. And for the life of me, I could not find it. I I'll have to come back here in the daylight to find it because I'm never finding it tonight. <laughs> any other exercise stories or any other stories? I, I, I would just say the army in Germany was different than the army at Fort Knox. There was always stuff going on behind the scenes. You always had to keep your head on a swivel to find out what's going on next around here. <laughs> Fort Knox was like the army that you picture, you know, everybody working together and uh, we've got a mission and we get to accomplish it and we're all good, you know, no problems amongst anybody. And then you get to Germany and there's, well, you know, there's drug testing's always going on. We're always losing guys to that all the time because they're testing positive for this and that. Yeah. Were there any guys serving, still serving who had been in Vietnam? Oh, yeah. We had, a, I had most of my NCOs that, uh, I looked up to were all Vietnam veterans. Yeah, they, they, they were they were all really good. Yeah, they treated us like their kids, you know, because they had been kids when they were us when they were in the army. So they knew what it was like. And I, I was privileged to get to see these guys and serve with them. Yeah, they were real, really great guys. And the the guys in your crew, I mean, what were their backgrounds? Where had they, you know, come from? Well, I, I had a number of different guys all the time. Uh, but when, when when I was finally in charge of them, uh, they were just two young guys. Uh, the one got in trouble right away when he got over in Germany, uh, like kind of like a wall. He was missing for two days. <laughs> he said he got lost, <laughs> so I had to stick up for him. You know, they because they're you know they want to throw the book at him and everything. And I said he's he's a good guy. He's just you know he, everybody when we get to Germany we're a little bit depressed because it's not. It's not America anymore, you know. You're you're in Germany now, and you have that moments when I said, you know, he's 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 worth the effort. Just you know, they gave him a week of uh, extra duty, and that was it. I mean, never he never had, I never had a problem with him after that because you know if you stick up for somebody, they'll usually always give you an extra, the extra effort they need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give them another chance, and then yeah, they so, they yeah, basically yeah yeah yeah. yeah. You know, you could tell, really, you could spot a guy real quick who was just never going to work out for you, and you try to work them off your crew as quick as you can. <laughs> because you don't, you don't have the time. You don't have the time, yeah. So how long are you in Germany for? Is it a couple of years? Two years, yeah. yeah I've, when you're initial enlistment and you volunteer, it's two years. If I was a reg, if my second time around, it would be three years. When When you look back over your... You know your four years. What was your worst memory, <laughs> or is there too many to mention? Well, I'll I'll pick out, pick I'll, out a couple. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the worst memory. <laughs> we didn't involve the blade tank, <laughs> so we were, we were in Hohenwelds, and I'm driving because uh, they get put two new guys on my tank, and the recipe for disaster is having a new driver at Hohenwelds because you can. I'll tell, I, when I was driving a tank, I never threw a track because you can tell right away when the track is ready to come off. You start hearing a popping sound, and that's the end connector trying to come off the sprocket. 
It, 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 you hear it. You can pop, 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 pop. You let go of the T bar and the tank will straighten itself out and you won't throw a track. So I'm down in the driver's compartment and I'm following behind the other tanks in front of us. And I can't see the, you know, all of a sudden I see this guy go into the hole and come out and I'm thinking, oh, that hole's going to be kind of deep for us to go into. But I can't see because I'm in the driver's compartment. I have this limited view. And I start going down the hole and about halfway down, I go, oh, yeah, this is going to be bad because, you know, the blade is going to bite into the other side of that hole now. And yet we stuck and the track is spinning. So I jump out real quick because I got the tow cables already the, already hooked up. And I go up and the guy in front of me was Sergeant Sloan. He was a Vietnam veteran. He was our, our section. We, we were headquarters section then. Just him and me. Uh, six six was the command tank, and six eight was the blade tank. And I'm like, you know, motioning for him to come back at me, and he's waving at me, and he leaves, and I'm like, what? And so then I turn around, and tanks behind us are all backing up. They're they're just leaving us, and I'm like, oh my god! And you know, our radio hadn't worked a whole lot just the whole time we were at Hohenfelds because something was wrong with something every time we. You know, started to tank up and in the in the motor pool worked fine but the second we put power to the thing it would trip the breaker on it so all we had was intercom which as long as you got intercom you can still operate as a vehicle so that that doesn't deadline you yeah but i can't contact anybody now i don't know where they're going what's going on i'm stuck in this hole that they left me in so we're there and luckily i was you know i'm always I'm tank commander. I have to think ahead of time. I had gotten sea rash, a case of sea rations for us just in case something would happen because the last thing he wanted is not to have any food for the guys, you know. So we're stuck here, and I'm thinking, well, what are we going to do now? We try everything we can to stop the track from spinning, and nothing's working. You know, there's the old trick of turning the end connector so it faces down and digs into the dirt, but I've already figured out. Oh, by the time that's getting us out, it's going to be tearing the fender off in the back with the hydraulics. So I can't do that. So uh, we just wait. And a night goes by. And when I say it's night, I mean, now this is when it's dark, dark. There's no, we're in the middle of the trees and there's no moon and it is pitch black. So, you know, nobody, you don't, this is a, we have to have a rotation for watch in case somebody comes around. So we do that every two hours, one of us is up and. Then morning comes and I'm frustrated as I'll get out. And so I go off by myself to have my little pity party. And then they come back and I say, okay, do any of you guys have any ideas? And Cornwell, the driver, he goes, why don't we take, we always have this extra track block that's sitting there in case we break a pin or something on the track. You just can do, use that. Why don't we take that and jam that under the track with the end connectors down? And I go, I go, well, that might work. So we jam it under the track that's spinning, and I put him in the driver's seat, and I told him, if it's going, just keep going. Don't stop. And we start up the tank, and sure enough, that they mesh with the other track, and it was just like a cog. And it pushed, and it pushed like two tons of dirt <laughs> it was on the end of that blade by the time it came out of that hole. And oh, my God, look at that. So we got it out by ourselves because Cornwall had the good idea. And I have made sure he got credit for it, but he never got anything for it, you know, because the, the stupid manual never said to do anything like that. You know, I had the recovery, self-recovery manual. I'm looking at that, shoved this tree under. Yeah, that didn't work for two seconds. <laughs> So so now now we're there and I'm like, well, we can't go anywhere because we don't know where they're at. We're not going to go waltzing all over Hohenfelds looking for them. We'll have to just stay here. And so we're out and we're like, we have a, we were, you know, training. So we have the miles gear. So we have live ammunition, not live ammunition, but blank ammunition on the tank. So I, every half hour, I rack off 20 rounds of the 50. So you know, who's up there looking for us, they can hear us, you know, because we can't talk to anybody. And about an hour later, here comes Sergeant Teague from the recovery vehicle. He's walking up the thing, and he's heard the machine gun going off. And he comes up to me, and I go, oh, you finally showed up, did you? He goes, well, we, we were told you couldn't get out. I go, well, we got tired of waiting for you, so we got out ourselves. <laughs> so yeah but nobody came to look for us i mean the first sergeant's supposed to be looking for us to bring us food or something he didn't come nobody came well i could have been out in 10 minutes if they'd come back and hooked us up but no but i couldn't yell at them because they're you know but i could yell at sergeant sloan and he's calling me he calls me marty all the time because you know 
last name Thoman, so I got the nickname Marty. He goes, yeah, so when he's, when he's happy with me, he calls me Marty. So he goes, Marty, I didn't have any choice. They ordered me to leave you. And I just looked at him and go, you know, Sergeant Stone, they could never have ordered me to leave you. I would never have done that. And he goes, I know. I go, well, just so you know that. <laughs> Well, they they should have added that uh, technique of of getting out the hole to the manual. It should be the the Cornwell technique. Or something. <laughs> it, it really should, because it really was. You know, it was something it's something that's sitting there all the time, but you never think about it until you need it. And then I looked at that, and go, son of a bitch, yeah, that will work, won't it? <laughs> what 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 is your fondest memory? Would you say? Well, my parents came over to visit me. When I was in Germany, and of course we were, I told them, I go, you know, I don't, I don't know where we'll be. We could be anywhere, anytime. And we were at Hohenfeld for the, when they came, and so they were at the front gate. And the sergeant major, we, I'll, I'll say this about sergeant major, sergeant major Hill, he was one of the best NCOs you ever have in the army. They told him what company I was with, and so he says, "This is where you got to be, cross the street right there, stay there, be there at about eight o'clock t- tomorrow night. That's when they're coming back." And so, we up, we on rail load, and we come up and did the front gate. And there's my mom and dad. Wow, hell of a moment. Yeah. I'll say, you know, of all the guys in the, in the unit, only two of us had our parents come visit us. That was one of them. So, you know, and, you know, you never really realize how special your parents are until, because all these guys just gravitated to my parents because they never had that. And so and it was my parents' last day there. They, you know, these are guys I hardly ever talked to. You know, these are guys from other platoons and that and the company. But they want to throw a party for my parents, so. They took him out to the restaurant and they threw a big party for him. It was very nice. Mark, thanks so much for um, sharing that. I think what what you've just said there really illustrates well what just doesn't come across um, in the printed word as an account. So I appreciate your um, honesty um, with that. Um are there any other stories uh, that we should be covering today? Uh, the, the, uh, pretty much the only thing I, I'll say about the. Did you ever read the book Red Army by uh, Ralph Peters? Uh, no, I don't think I have. It's a, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fiction book. It's a fiction book. You should read it. It's really good because it, cover, it covers the areas that nobody ever thinks about. And the main, main thing in that book, and that was actually basically most of the book is written about the British sector of the you know, NATO. That's what most of the action's going on. But it's about resupply. The whole book, you know, the basic gist is we thought resupply would be easier than it was. And a lot of these tank units are running out of ammo very quickly. And at one point, they have a Soviet unit and a British unit ramming each other because they don't have any more ammunition to shoot at each other. So, and that that is the one thing, you know, we never practice is resupply. We never practice having the vehicles come up and resupply us of ammo which you know it, it goes to show you i don't think anybody ever thought we were going to live long enough to be resupplied of ammo so so that, that's why that's one thing that clicked in my head once i read that i go you know son of a, you know we practiced every other damn thing even nuclear oh yeah that was the other thing at the at the carbine fortress reforger they even did a simulated nuclear friend friendly nuclear exchange you know they, they transmitted to us there's going to be a nuclear weapon set off at this point, and you have like 30 minutes to get into a safe area, which is, uh, you know, you try to get yourself behind the hill between that and it, where the blast is at, and everything from inside outside the tank has to go in. And I mean everything, the camouflage netting, all your equipment, the antennas, everything has to get crammed inside the tank. We have hardly any room in there for us after that, you know? <laughs> And then you wait, then you wait, because now you don't have a radio, so you don't know when, so when it's all clear. So you wait uh, 30 minutes after a supposed blast, and then you start on opening up and finding out. <laughs> and, I mean, if, if if there were tactical nukes going off, what what was 
you you're supposed well, to that's, that's 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 that that's the end of the war you know <laughs> once they start throwing those around you know it you know we had officers that would say oh we could win that i go what are you crazy the soviets are going to put up with that for a long they're going to start nuking cities after we start throwing them around <laughs> you know it's just human it's just human nature yeah <laughs> I mentioned in the introduction that Mark has suffered from PTSD for the last 30 years, and this was due to an accident involving his friend, Dean McCoy. Now, Mark was unable to describe the uh, the circumstances of uh, Dean's accident, but he did write to me and uh, has sent me some text, um, which I'm now going to read to you. We pulled into the assembly area by the railway tracks at about 3am. The train was not there yet and the company commander parked us along the tracks. It was C-22 with just me and the driver. All the senior NCOs had gone back to Catabac for a Sergeant Morales board that picks an NCO who best takes care of his troops. I jumped down off the tank and noticed my boot was right next to the track. It was a chilling morning. I started pulling the tie-down cables out of the sponson box when a voice enters my head. Mark, get up on the tank. A very quiet voice, and it only says it once. So I climb up on the tank and say to myself, now what do I do? Now the Greek tragedy unfolds. I hear cables being dragged on the ballast rocks behind me. I turn around, a flat car is dragging tie cables within inches right past my tank. I look at the tank behind me and Dean is being crushed between his tank and a flat car. He had already been hit by the first one and was now getting in again from the second. I yell medic and my driver John Main jumps on the flat car waving his flashlight at the engineer. I say, John, it's going to stop in a few minutes. The medics arrive and start working on Dean. They need a blanket to put him in. I grab mine and we get him in it and carry him out. Dean died on the way to the hospital. He never said a word or uttered a sound. The silence of it all is what sticks in my mind. I found out later the station master had not walked the tracks before the train's arrival and the engineer had not sounded his horn because it was so early. Also, the CO had parked us too close. The next year when we came back, the whole rail yard was changed. The German government had made it so no one else could have this happen to them. Mark describes some of the symptoms of his PTSD to me. He said, It would feel like someone was sitting on the edge of my bed, and sometimes holding me down. But with Mark Halpin's help, I got in contact with Dean's wife Petra and told her of her husband's final days. He was so close to home, but never made it. Now, if you're a regular listener, you'll know that I often talk about the the unknown casualties of the Cold War, those that died on exercise or, or in accidents. And with Mark's blessing, we're dedicating this episode to Dean McCoy, who never made it back from the Cold War. Thank you for listening today. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.